Romans chapter number 8. And uh, I tell you, I had uh, a few different thoughts on, uh, on my mind for this morning. It's a sound uh, horrible. We were at the conference, and one of the men talked about how he said, uh, somebody said that preaching is like, um, he said, after you get through preaching a sermon, some people say it's like digging an eight-foot hole. And he said, whoever said that's never dug an eight-foot hole. Um, he said, but it is, this is what he likened it to. Because it takes a lot out of you putting stuff together and getting them preaching. But he said, um, he said, what it is like, this is what his, he, I'll give you the guy's number later. You can call him and get mad at him later, not me. He said that um, it was like giving birth. And uh, some of you ladies are going, you are crazy. But he said, it's like on Monday, you're, you start, you know, everything starts growing. And, and then you get closer to to uh, Sunday, and finally you get up Sunday, it's all the, the labor pains start to set in, and you're finally trying to give birth to a, a message for the people that everybody can get something from. And, uh, and then he said, sometimes, he said, it feels like you're getting closer to Sunday, and you feel like you're going to have to adopt a message from somewhere because you haven't got anything yet, and so you're trying to figure out where I'm going to get a message from. you got to adopt. And I looked over at, I forget who was sitting next to me, it's probably uh, uh, Pastor Bishop, and I said, Sometimes I feel like I'm giving birth to triplets. I don't know which message is going to come out when I get up to the to give deliver, and uh, and that's the way I felt about about this today. I felt like I'm not sure which one's the best one because uh, all of them would be good and be helpful uh, for you. I even thought about when he sang that song. If I, verses flooded my mind of saving grace, and if it wasn't for the grace of God, we would not be saved. And I thought about strengthening grace and God giving us the strength to get through some things. I'm going to use one of those verses today. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 8 and 9, it talks about serving grace, of you, from the grace of God, you giving to other people and helping other people. And then we talk, there's verses that talk about in Hebrews about uh, coming before the throne of grace to find mercy and grace when you're in prayer. There's so much that can be said about grace, and uh, there's, there's so many things that can be said out of this book that would be a blessing and a help. I thought about, though, where I kind of settled in my heart before coming to the pulpit was a part two to the sermon I gave you on Wednesday. The reason why I wanted to do it today is because I didn't want there to be too much time in between what I said on Wednesday and what I'll say the next time to finish the sermon. Um, I didn't want too much time to pass, so you would miss the thought that kind of carried over. In Romans chapter number 8, I want you to look, and the, the title of the message is, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People, and this is part two um, in that. And I just thought about this the other day. I thought about it when I was... Um, when I was putting this together, that there's a man standing on a railroad track. And I thought, I, I just put that, that, that video, that, that, that uh, picture together when I was doing it, didn't think much about it. And then I thought about the fact that sometimes, because the point number one in the message was sometimes we make poor decisions is why bad things happen. And sometimes we put ourselves in a bad spot. And, um, and so, you know, walking down a railroad tracks might not be the best thing for a person to do. And so sometimes we put ourselves in a bad spot. I want you to think about this for a minute. Why do bad th things happen to good people? Sometimes bad things happen in our life because we are not listening to God. We're not submitting ourselves to the word of God, the truths of God. And we've said to ourselves, I can do it my way. I don't need God. I don't need the Bible. I don't need instruction. I don't need any of those things. I'll do it my way. I've got a Frank Sinatra type of spirit, and I'm just going to do it my way. And so you do that, and sometimes at the end of that road, you realize man, this was a really bumpy road and it really didn't work out the way I thought. And we find ourselves sometimes going, why are these bad things happening? It's because we're making bad decisions. And sometimes people say, why do, why do I feel like I'm always in a bad relationship? Why does it feel like I'm always uh, in, a, in, a, in a messed up situation with my finances? I'm always messed up in a situation with I'm getting in trouble. Maybe it's because the series of decisions you're making are bad decisions. And you find yourself in a problem and you say, why is all this happening to me? And really, if God could open up your life and point out the different decisions you've made, he would say, listen, because you keep making bad decisions instead of submitting yourselves to the truths of God's word. That's the first one we said the other day. But Romans chapter 8, look at verse number 16. The spirit itself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So I'm a, I'm a child of God. If you're saved, you're a child of God. And if children, then heirs. Well, I'm, I'm heirs with God. Well, there's some good things happening here. I've got the Spirit of God. I'm an heir with God. And I'm a joint heir with Christ. But it goes on, it says, If so be that you suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. You say, wait a minute. I, I was liking the first verse and a half because I've got an heir. I've got an inheritance. I've got his spirit. I'm his child. All those things are really good. I'm a joint heir with Christ. I'm an heir with God. This is, this is great. But 
Now you're talking about suffering. So we'll have suffering in this life? Yes. Nobody ever said that the Christian life would be without trouble. In fact, the Bible is really clear that the Christian life will have trouble. So somebody says, well, why would good, bad things happen to good people? Well, we're going to go on and read this, and I'm going to give you a couple points from this. It'll be a help to you uh, this morning. He says this. Uh, he says, for, uh, let me read verse 17 again. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So there's something better coming, and the things we go through in this life are not, they're not even to be compared with the things we're going to find in the life to come. Verse 19, For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God to where we are with him, manifesting, glorified to be with him. Verse 20, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption under the glorious liberty of the children of God. It's very, like, sounds complicated. It's very easy when you think about it in a second. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. I've got the Spirit of God. We saw in verse number 16, and so do you. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies. So here, let me get this to clear this up for you. You're, how many of you would say this morning, I know that I'm a child of God. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. All right, now what you have is a promise in the word of God that there will be trouble. There will be trouble. And it says the whole creation, it says that we ourselves groan. There's times that we're groaning saying, God, when are you going to set all these things right? God, when are you going to call me home? When are we going to get all these things taken care of? The, the economy is crazy, and, the, and the, the politics is crazy, and there's sickness in the world, and I've got problems in my own home, and I've got this going on. When are you going to get me out of here? My whole body's groaning, just waiting for the day that God calls me home. That happens to us, but he says more than just with us, all of creation is doing that. All of the world, and as we get, the Bible says, as we get closer and closer and closer to the day that the Lord comes back, all of things are going to be, there's more and more of natural things that are going to be going on. Why? Because the whole earth is groaning, and the whole earth is travailing, just waiting for the day that God sets everything right. You say, well, why is it all like this? Well, it started in the garden, what? Perfect. Everything was perfect. What wrecked it all? Sin. And the Bible says that sin came into this world, death would sin, and everything got destroyed from sin entering into the world. And you, you know that after sin entered the world, there was natural things that were going on. There, was, there, was, uh, there, was, uh, um, there would be morality things that were bad. Uh, brothers are killing brothers. People are killing each other, lying and stealing, and all the things that go on that you've seen through the history of time that's gotten worse. And the Bible says they'll get worse and worse and worse. So you look at the TV and you go, man, it's getting bad out there. Well, the Bible has promised us that it'll actually get worse and worse and worse. Naturally, morally, it'll get worse and worse. In the garden, I said this the other day on Wednesday, in the garden when God made it perfect, you never would have seen a child born, a baby born with a missing limb or with any kind of sickness or any kind of Down syndrome or anything that was in there. You wouldn't have seen that. But the effects of sin on this world, on humans, on everything, has brought with it sickness and disease and deformity and everything. And the whole, what it says here, the whole creation is just waiting for the day that God says, I'll set everything right again. All of it's waiting for that. And so you see that in here. And so what he says, when he gets down to verse number 24, he starts talking about hope. Our hope is, it's not that I hope I'm saved. My, my hope is the only hope I have in a world that is this chaotic and crazy is Jesus Christ. I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, we're going through the worst thing we've ever experienced in our life as a family. And they, this is what their comment was. The, the dad told me this. He said, I, I know that I'm a child of God. I know there's people that have to go through these same types of things that don't know God. And his statement was, I don't know how people make it through the things they go through in this life without God and Christians around them to help get them through them. This whole world's going through it. The difference is we've got God to help get us through it. We've got a hope. 
And then you look at verse number 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. We're going to have infirmities. We're going to have troubles. But this is what he's given us. He's talked about the Spirit in verse number 16. He's talked about the Spirit down in verse number 23. We've got the Spirit of God in us. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and the Spirit is helping you as you go through these difficulties in life. As you go through them and as you're, you're saying, I don't even know what to do. Because it says, likewise, the spirits also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So you can get in a spot where you say, I don't even know what to pray for. Has anybody ever been there before? You get in a spot where you're just, you're so down and out. You're saying, I don't even know how to pray about this situation. I don't know if I should pray that this gets done. I don't know if I should pray that that gets done. I don't know how to pray, God, uh, take care of this. I don't know if it's, God, I need more patience. I don't know if, God, I need you to intervene. I don't even know what to pray. And so sometimes what we'll do is we'll find ourselves just fall to our knees and begin to cry out to God and weep and just wail. And what the Bible says is the Spirit speaks on our behalf to God. Not that the Spirit causes us to utter something, but the Spirit speaks things that we can't utter to God for us, and our heart speaks to God for us. It says, but the Spirit itself make an intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. We can't utter them. He speaks to God while we're not saying anything at all, just groaning within our heart. Groanings, the word groanings used over and over again. We're groaning. This world is groaning. Nature is groaning. Animals are groaning. Trees, everything in this world is groaning, just waiting for the day that it's set back uh, the way it's supposed to be. And while we're going through it in this life, the Spirit is in us, helping us get through everything we're going through. Make an intercession for us. Verse 27, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, verse 28, this is the verse most people use, but they don't really understand that it's in a context here and it fits. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God's working it out. You say it doesn't feel good. I know, but God can take, listen now, this is a key statement. God can take, in this world, there's going to be some bad things happen. Say amen. God can take even the worst things about what's going on in this world and you in the midst of them, as you don't even know what to say, as you hold on to the hope that is God, and as the Holy Spirit makes intercession for you and you find yourself groaning, God can take even those crazy, terrible tragedies and turn them around for his purpose and to work some kind of good out somewhere. God has a way of doing that. In verse number 29, it says, For whom he did foreknow, we also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, there's some things here that people get always get really scared about. You know what all this is saying in verse 29 and 30? It's saying we've got a promise. That's all it's saying. It's got a promise. You know what the promise is? God has started a work in you if you've gotten saved. He will get you all the way to the end. So here you are going, I'm just telling you this, here you are going through something in life. I, you say, but I got saved, preacher. I, verse number 16 is my verse. I got saved. I'm a child of God. The Spirit's in me. The Spirit, His Spirit's bearing witness of my spirit. I'm a child of God. I'm saved. And the preacher said everything would be better after that. I'm sorry, that preacher wouldn't tell you the whole truth. It is good that you got saved, but there is some things that will happen. There are some things that will happen in our life after you get saved. It didn't say that you're going to be moved out of this world. You're going to still be in this world. And because of the fall, because of sin, death and sin is still working in this world. And we're still going to have to navigate ourselves through a world that is a mess. And I said this on Wednesday. You can walk through a beautiful field, and if it's muddy, I promise you, you're going to get some mud on you somewhere. You can't get through the walk through the field without a little bit of the mud getting on you somewhere. Now, what I said to you the other day, number one, is sometimes we find ourselves in the really bad parts of it because we've made poor decisions walking away from the things God wants us to do and dabbling in some of that, playing in the mud pits, and we've got ourselves messed up because of that. And we can always go back to God. We can get that right. But the second thing I told you is it's because, according to this, we live in an evil world and so as you navigate, as a child of God, through an evil world, I promise you, you're going to bump into some evil things along the way that are sometimes going to affect you. 
And we talked about this in depth on Wednesday, and if you didn't get to listen to it, go back and listen to it again. I told you a couple of things that come from that, and that is this. We, when you hit a spot in life that is bad, you don't act like it didn't happen, but you also don't make it the defining moment of your life. I get a little bit of mud on me. I don't walk around showing everybody, look, I got some mud on me. It doesn't make it's part of me, but it's not the defining moment of my life. <clears throat> and you go through some things in life, you may bump into some really bad things that affect your family, but that doesn't mean that from then on your family is scarred, your family is marred, or that you're scarred, or that you're marred, or that you're no good, or you're second class. No, no, no. You can still go through this life in the grace of God and still accomplish much for God. But the number three thing that I want to say, number one, poor decisions. Number two, we're in a fallen world and we run into these things. Number three, sometimes bad things will happen to good people because God is trying to use those things to get our attention. God is trying to use those things to get our attention. And God can bring good out of every situation. And God uses natural things and even difficult things sometimes in life to try to bring us a little closer to him. I want to show you a few of these in the Bible. I'll just give you as many as I can. Look at John chapter number John chapter number 9 very quickly this morning. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter number 9. John chapter number 9, look at verse number 1. Remember I told you that in the garden you wouldn't have had any of these things. Imperfections, things that were difficult, difficulties, they, uh, they weren't found in there. But when sin came in, death came in, sin came in, all those things came in with that. And so now here you are, John chapter 9, you're going to find a man born blind. John chapter number 9, a man born blind. Look at verse number 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Was it something his parents did when he was in the womb that, that caused him to have, they did something wrong and it, it brought something into him and it caused me blind? Was it, was it that or was it something that, that maybe he did? Or was it, what, what, what was this that caused this? Verse number three, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat in the ground and made clay in a spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Now, what's going to happen is there are People are going to question, is this really the right guy? Did we get this right? Get his parents, make sure it's the right guy. The, the Pharisees are going to question it, and uh, they're going to say, man, this guy's a sinner. He didn't keep the Sabbath right. He can't be somebody that's, that's healing people of their blindness. This doesn't make any sense. And, um, and so uh, in verse number 24, they brought him in again. They again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Jesus can't do this. He's a sinner. We don't believe he did it. And he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. All he can say is, Listen, I'm gonna give, this is what he did. I'm going to give you a testimony. This is what he said to everybody. I'm going to give you a testimony. I was, I was one way before I met Jesus, and now I'm another way after I've met Jesus. Now, let me make a couple of statements here. It's not that we're looking for blind people to come in and for some man to heal and do something, and now they get sight so that people can believe. We're not talking about that. Those, that's a whole different subject that goes on. Those types of things went on with the apostles, and those were some things that were for the apostles to confirm the word. Mark chapter 16 says all of that, and all that can be laid out very, very clearly. But what I am saying is this. What Jesus didn't spend any time doing was talking about why the man started off blind. He didn't spend any time there. What he did do is this. Wherever this man, however this man got there, I'm about to do something in the life of this man to use him as a testimony of how great I am. Now, this is what I want you to get a hold of. There are times in your life that you'll go through some things. Maybe it's some terrible things in your life. This this kid could have grown up, mom could have been saying, I don't know, honey, why you can't see. I don't know why this is like this, 
We may not ever know why this is like this. If she was maybe wise in the, in the things of God, she maybe could say, look, it wasn't like this in the, in the garden, honey, but, but it is like this now. We're just going to trust God through all this. And maybe that would be the case. Maybe there, there's no way of understanding why it's like it. But at it, a it, certain point in time, God showed up and used that situation as an example of how good he was. Bad, listen, a bad situation, naturally bad situation, but in it, God did something to glorify God and glorify Jesus Christ in a bad situation. Now, I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you, that where somebody, not, the first point I have on this is sometimes God will, will have something, use, not that he does it, but use something that's going on in our lives to get us, get our attention and get us to come to God. Some of you have a testimony of this. Some of you have a testimony that you're just walking through life, not really caring about eternity, not really thinking about where eternity would be, not really thinking about life and death. Maybe you're a young person, not even thinking about that. At 26 years old, I wasn't thinking a single bit about uh, death. I wasn't thinking about life after this life. I wasn't thinking about any of those things. I was thinking, man, I'll, I'll live forever. I'll, I'll go forever. There's nothing. I, I don't have any sickness. I have any ailments. I can do things. I can run forever. I can, I can do everything I need to do. There's nothing. I, I don't have any issues. And so there was no need for me to think about death until we had a, an extremely tragic thing that happened to our family. And we had a person, a young person in our family die. And when that young person in our family died, it shook the entire family. It shook us all to the point that we all began to think, where did he go when he died? It began to make all of us think, where will we go when we die? It began to think, what is life after this life? And we begin to think about and question, will religion really get you to the life after this life? Is there more to this? What is, what is the real story here? And it was around that time that I began to work at, in, uh, in CID for a drug team. And I've been to work for a man that was a, a preacher. And, uh, and I've told you this, this illustration many times, but I, I began to work for him. I began to ask him questions about this thing. And as I began to ask him questions, he began to show me from the Bible what the Bible says about Jesus Christ, about life. And, and I had heard things about Jesus, but never really heard who Jesus really was. And he began to explain to me that Jesus died on the cross uh, for my sins, was buried, and rose again the third day, but to pay the penalty for my sins and the sins of the world, but that I would have to receive him as my Lord and Savior, that I was a sinner separated from God, and my sins had separated me from God, but that my sins could be forgiven. I could be washed clean in the blood of Jesus Christ, what he shed by putting my faith in what he did. And one day, February the 13th, 2000, I, I knelt down in my living room at my house, and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And you say, what? What was that in your mind? In my mind, a terrible thing happened in our life. I would not say that God orchestrated it. I would say the thing that was bad that happened in our life was a product of a wicked world and the pressures of a wicked world. And it caused a traumatic thing in our lives. But I can tell you, that bad, bad thing, that God didn't create that bad thing, but God certainly took that bad thing that happened that we were at in our life, and he made it into something to glorify himself in the lives of all that family. Now, everybody in that family, myself, I, I'm, I'm a child of God. I've, I can claim all those things from Romans chapter 8. I'm, I'm an heir and joint heir. I can claim all of that. I have a hope that I can look forward to, that I've got a spirit inside of me making intercession when I don't know what to pray about. All those things are true because on February the 13th, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. But the thing that got my attention and woke me up so I would come to God was a tragic event that happened in this world. My wife's sitting back there. My wife's saved. That was her brother. My wife saved because God took a terrible thing in our life that I don't believe it was orchestrated by God, but it was something that God used to turn her heart towards God. My mother-in-law, many of you all know her. You know me sitting in the back row. She's laying out of church, and uh, she's backslidden, laying out of church. Down in, no, she's not. She's, she's down in Houston caring for her sister-in-law's uh, home, uh, her sister-in-law's on vacation, but she watches these. She's probably, I'll probably get a message pop up any second now or something. And, uh, and she's watching. She's a child of God today. God can take 
in this terrible world we live in and some of the terrible things we're going to experience, God can take those terrible things and draw people to him. None of us, none of us like the fact that, that Brother Worth went home to be with the Lord the other, the other week. But he was a child of God, he knew the Lord. Nobody liked the fact that he sat in a bed for, for, for all that time and he was just asking God for mercy. But I can tell you something that I know to be true. I know to be true. There were nurses that came into that home to see a child of God leaving this place gracefully. And I promise you it impacted them somehow. I promise you that if you go and look at our Facebook page and you go look at how many people, I don't even know what the numbers are at now, but if you went and looked at the people around the world that have seen that service, there are people that have been touched by God through something that is really heartbreaking for everybody else, but that somebody else, God can use it to draw them towards him. And so to come to him, to come to him. Let me give you another one very quickly. Look at, uh, at 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Look at another one. This will be an interesting one for us. And 1 Corinthians chapter 11. God can use those things to get our attention, to come to him. The next one, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse number 17. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. Now this, the book of 1 Corinthians is an interesting book. The whole thing is a rebuke. <laughs> he, just, he just writes a long letter to a church telling them how many things have got messed up in their church. Could you imagine if the person that founded this church uh, heard everything about this church, wrote us a long letter, and we're like, praise the Lord, we got a letter from the man that founded this church. He wants to say some things to us. Everybody get you a seat. Let's go through it. And he went through and said, there's divisions. There's fornication. There's, there's, uh, there's marriage problems. There is problems with submission. There's problems in chapter 8 all the way through 10 with your Christian liberty and how you're causing other people to stumble. In chapter 11, there's problems with, with authority in the first half of it. And then he gets to the second half of chapter 11 and says, you all have a problem in the way you're doing the Lord's Supper. And then he gets to the very end. Look at the very end of 34, the very end of chapter 11. At that last sentence, he says, and the rest will I set in order when I come. He said, I wrote a whole long letter that's got all these things in it you're doing wrong. And at the end of it, he says, uh, and the rest of it, there's more, but I just didn't have time. I ran out of ink. I'll get the rest of it settled when I get there. Can you imagine all that he's saying? This is what you got going on. And in it, he talks about something in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It's very interesting. Very interesting. Verse number 17. Now, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. They're coming together for the Lord's Supper. Meeting together, remembering what the Lord's done in his death, his burial, his resurrection. They're coming together for that. And he said, it's not actually better, it's actually for the worse. Y'all are doing some things that are for the worse. Watch what he says. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. So there's, there's people coming together. I watch they're together. Here we are together in this room, big crowd of people together in this room. Geographically, we could be together. But you know that in your heart, you can be very divided. There are divisions among you. Verse 19, for there must be also heresies among you. There are false things being taught and talked about, that they which are approved may manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, the other is drunken. So there's all these things that are going on. They're, they're coming together. When they come together, one's taking a whole bunch and leaving this one over there. There's no fellowship. There's no unity. It's just really a bad thing. In verse number 24, it says, And when he had, he's going to rehearse to them what the Lord's Supper was. He said, When he had given things, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Uh, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. But what a great remembrance of who the Lord is. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Let me, let me make a statement right here. I want you to get something. The idea that he says to them, he says, you're coming together geographically. You're all together in one place. You say you're there to remember the Lord and what the Lord's done and how he's broken his body and spilt his blood for you. You say that's what you're gathered together for. You say that you're gathered in unity, loving each other and taking everything, but you're not. 
You're geographically in one place, but you're not in unity in your heart. And what you are is you're divided, and one person's got his little pile of what he's eating, and another person's got nothing, and there's no love, there's no unity. To get, you're, to, you're in a big crowd in one place, but your heart is not together in one place. He said, that's what the problem is. What was the body, what was God, what did God break his, his body, his, his, not his bones, but his body being broken open and his blood being spilt for, so that we could all be one in Christ? That's what it's for. In verse number 28 says, but let a man examine himself. And so let him eat that bread and drink that cup. When we do what we're doing, when we have the Lord's Supper, people get this all messed up. When you have the Lord's Supper, it's always about remembering that the Lord gave his body for all of us to be one. His blood was shed so that all could be clean and be one. That's what that's all about. It's all about oneness and unity in Christ. And so when you see this, he says, yeah, man, he's examined himself. Watch from verse number 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. What's the discerning the Lord's body? You know what you are? You're the body of Christ. That's what you are. You're the body of Christ. And together, we should be caring one for another. You say, well, I'm the, you're, the, you're the head and I'm the pinky toe. I've told you this before. I've given this illustration before. I have gotten mad at my phone, and, you know, anger doesn't profit anything. But I got mad at my phone one time, and, and, and smartphones aren't always smart. And I turned to throw it, and, and I was in flip-flops in the yard, and everything turned but my pinky toe. It stuck in the dirt. And when it did, my body went this way, but my pinky toe was out that way. I'm telling you something. The pinky toe matters. <laughs> I limped for, like, three weeks thinking my toe was broken for three I don't care if you're the head or the pinky toe. You are significant to God. And here's the thing. When there's disunity amongst the group, this is where it gets to it. Watch this now. Not discerning the Lord's body that every part's important. For this cause, verse 30, for this cause many are, watch now, weak and sickly among you and many sleep. You know what? God allowed to visit that group. Now think about this for a minute. Why are bad things happening to good people? God allowed sickness and weakness to visit a group of people. Why? To chasten them, to get their attention, to get their attention, to get their attention, and chasten them so they would get right and get in unity. Why are bad things happening to good people? Sometimes it's so that you will wake up and come to him. Sometimes it's to chasten you so that you will recognize the course you're on. Listen real close. The course you're on is the wrong course. Verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, listen, if you would just stop and examine yourself and judge yourself, we would not be judged. When we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Now, there's several things here about one another and things like that. But the second point, the point I want you to get first was so we would come to him. The second one is so we would conform to him or we could, we could be more like him. And God can allow some corrupt things to enter into our life to wake us up and get us on the right track. I just did a devotion the other day. Uh, when we do our devotions, I did a devotion out of 2 Chronicles chapter 28. And there was one of the kings, and one of the kings was over dabbling in a bunch of junk that he had no business dabbling in, doing a lot of wicked things he shouldn't have done. And the Bible said, and I circled it when I was reading it and doing my devotion, it says, wherefore God allowed an enemy to come up and oppress him. Now here's this king saying, man, why are bad things happening to me? I'm the king of Israel. I'm the, I think he was the king of Judah. I'm the king of Judah. And I'm, well, I'm doing great things. Look at me. I'm, I should be, everything should be okay. I'm the king. But he's doing things he has no business doing, dabbling in things he has no business dabbling in. He's in wickedness. And it says because he was in wickedness, God allowed something to come into his life. For what purpose? Just so God gets his kicks out of, out of, uh, out of, of discipline and children? No, to drive that man back to where he needed to be with God. And then what it says is, you get down the latter half of that whole chapter, you get down there, it says that when he found himself in distress. You know what? God doesn't want you to be in distress. 
But if you're away from God, it's going to be distressing. You see, when he found himself in distress, instead of turning to God and saying, God, I get it. I get it. I've been away from you. I've been messed up. I need to get right with you. Like the prodigal came to himself, went back to the father's house. I get it. Instead of doing that, you know what he did? He went deeper and deeper into it and said it led to his ruin. Sometimes bad things happen to what we feel like, well, they're pretty good people, but it's so God can wake us up. Listen, if there was, I don't know what, <laughs> somebody says, is that what COVID is? I, listen, I have no clue. But I can tell you that in the midst of this, it'll either do one of two things, drive you further away or drive you closer together. And so it pushed us, it, it, it was there to try to get them to wake up that they need to be closer together. And the last one I'll tell you is this. It is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'll just do it very quickly and show it to you. You don't have to turn there, but I will read it to you. And you know this one pretty well. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is going through a difficult time in his life. And in verse number 7, it says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Now, here I am. I'm a good guy doing the right things. But yet there's something buffeting me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake, that I, when I am weak, then am I strong. The first thing I was saying, why do we go through bad things happen with good people? One is to get us our attention so we can come to him, so we'll conform to him when we're off track. We're chastening, conform to him. And the last one is, so we will count on him for our strength and our abilities. Sometimes, now this is the last little thing I'm going to say. Sometimes you go through life and you're thinking, especially people that are serving God, we can get to the place where we think, look at all the great things I'm doing. And I promise you, it is not by your strength. It is by God's strength. And so sometimes we may have to go through some things just so we learn. Watch now. We learn to trust God. We learn to depend on God in the midst of it. I've gone through them. I've gone through things before. Somebody said, how would you get through them? Every day I had to just wake up and depend on God for that, the strength for that day. We have to learn to, to just trust him in our adversity. I told you it was one more verse, and that's the famous thing a preacher says, but I'm, I am going to read you one more verse. If you, uh, if you want to start closing your Bible and getting your purse together, for all you gentlemen, you can do that. Just joking. Psalm 107. I'm just going to read this to you really quickly. Watch what it says. Listen, listen to what it says. Psalm 107. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. These are people just doing, doing their business in great waters, in the sea. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. Now watch now, this is why they see it. Here they are just doing their business, going, to, going in the sea, doing their business. Verse 25, for he commandeth and raiseth the stormy winds, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths. Think about it now, up and down. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. You ever been at your wit's end? You know, you can be at your wit's end and be right in the middle of God's will. You know, you can be in a storm where it feels like it's, it's to the heavens and it, when it, the, 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 the valley of the wave is in the depths. You know, you can still be in the middle of God's will at their wit's end. Why would God allow someone to go through something like that? Well, verse number 28 says, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. 
Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. You know what? God will sometimes let you go through some things so that you learn, watch now, so that you learn that God's in control. And that as we go through our daily life, look, God can get our attention. You're going through daily life just going to work. And God lets something come up. You say, why did this happen today to me? A flat tire of all things. Why? Why did this happen today to me? I was supposed to get on the plane. I was heading somewhere, and the plane, everything got delayed, and I got all messed up. Why did this happen to me? I remember I was going to your wife's funeral, and I got into D.C., and I was going to be driving to to New York for the funeral. I got into D.C., and a storm came, and they they said, the flights are canceled, we're not going anywhere. And I thought, I've got to be, by tomorrow morning, I think at 9 o'clock or so in the morning, I've got to be in upper in in New York. And I was in D.C., and I said, please, you've got to get a plane going. And this is what I said to myself. Why, God, would you let this happen to me? I'm trying to go do a good thing here. Why would you let this happen? I didn't know. But I talked to a bunch of people there and told them, listen, I'm, I'm a preacher. I'm trying to get to somewhere to be a help to a family. And they said, there's nothing you can do except for maybe rent a car. So I went, rented a car, and in a, I mean, a terrible storm, I drove the entire night. I got there about 10 minutes till 9 and walked in and did the funeral. Man, I'm trying to do what's right, and something happens. Sometimes God may let something come up in your life. Listen to me real close, just so that you can just get your attention. You can say, oh, yeah, God's in control, not me. And you can cry out to God and say, God, I trust you in the midst of my storm. And God say, that's kind of where I wanted your heart to be all along. And so that you can stand up in a congregation of people and say, I don't know about you. You're probably going through something over here. You're probably going through something over there. But can I just give you a testimony? Everybody a testimony. There's been times in my life when I've gone through some difficult things. I felt like I was at my wit's end. And I just cried out to God. God brought peace and God brought calm. And I just want to stand in the midst of the congregation and praise God for a little while and tell you that God's good. And God's in control. So why do bad things happen to good people? For some of you today, you don't know if Jesus Christ is your Savior today. And you need to get that settled in your heart. And the reason why sometimes things are happening to you is to get you to wake up and see that you need a Savior. For some of you, things are going on in your life because God's trying to show you that you're on the wrong track and it's a chastening to try to get you conformed to be more like Him. And for some of us, it's to wake us up and show us that God's really in control, I'm not, and that I need to trust God with my daily. I need to trust in the Lord with all my heart and not lean on my own understanding and all my ways acknowledge him and let him direct my path. But that's what we've got to be doing. And we've got to trust in him. In the days we're going through, folks, listen, you have got to learn to trust in God. We need God in the days we're in. Let's stand to our feet. Lord God, Father, you know the hearts of these people. If there's somebody that's lost, doesn't know you as their Savior, well, I pray you'd help them get that settled. I pray if there's somebody here that says, I feel like the chastening hand of, of God is in my life, and God, if you are working in your life, I pray you'd help them get that settled. Father, if there's people in here that right now need to just, in the midst of what they're going through and their wits in, they would just need to crawl out, cry out to you and watch you calm and work in their life, then I pray you'd let them work that out. Lord, I've tried to be, to be honest to the scriptures and, and prepare something that would be a help to these people. Now I pray your Holy Spirit would bear witness with what's been said and make application to the hearts of each person that needs it the most. Father, do a work. Don't let this be a, a time of just hearing and no doing, but let it be a time of doing. Lord, work in the hearts of these people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before she plays, let me say this. For some of you that are thinking, you know what? And watch now. Some of you are thinking, I... I'm glad he preached this because, oh, brother so-and-so, brother Daniel, he really needed to hear this message. Because I think that what he's going through is the number two thing. He's probably getting the chastening thing. That's what's going on with him. Let me tell you something. Don't worry about what God's doing in anybody else's life. And for goodness sake, don't walk up to somebody and try to offer up what you think God's doing in their life.